hospital in your car, um, would you worship with us, sing with us, pray with us when we're praying, and open up your heart to everything the Lord wants to do in this service through the worship and the sermon. So um, let's get in there. And we just we're so excited we get to do this with you guys. Good morning, church. How you feeling? Well, we're so excited to worship with you. We're going to sing a song this morning that is about just asking for an awareness of the presence of God in our life. But first, can I ask you to do something with us? Can you put your hands together like this? Come on, two, three, up! Come on. We sing this in faith, sing I give you glory. Turn to heaven and spoil. 
spoke your name into the night and then through the darkness your love and kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my name Well, good morning, everyone. What a powerful message that song gives us. Jesus Christ is our living hope. There is no other hope that we can find in this life to give us what Jesus gives us. And I am so grateful that we have people here today, many people who are saying, Jesus is my living hope, and I'm gonna give my life to him, and I'm gonna live for him, and I'm gonna do all this stuff that the, the mantra series is talking about. I'm gonna catch the wind. I'm gonna I'm gonna be the branch and I'm gonna grip the plow. I'm gonna do all these things because I'm gonna live my life for Jesus. So I'm glad each of you are doing that. So I'm gonna have you repeat the good confession after me. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, my Lord and Savior. Well, this is uh, Bridget Bell, and she comes here with her daughter, and they are uh, making a decision to follow Jesus together. And your daughter has had a big impact in you being here, which is really, really cool. So Bridget, because you placed your trust in Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, this is Chesney Bell. Chesney, because you placed your trust in Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Morning, church family. My name is Jeff. This is Leslie. We're here with our son and daughter, Charlie and Lola. We're very proud of them. We love them very much, and we're glad to be here today and for you all to witness this. So, Lola... With your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. With your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Ashley Pearson, and this is my friend Angel Henderson. We met through a makeup company, and as soon as we met, I knew God had placed her on my heart as, you know, can, don't forget about her, pursue her, and God has been pursuing her her whole life. She's gone through a lot of hardships, um, but she is ready to give her life over to her Savior, and she is just so redeemed. And because you've placed your trust in Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> Uh, this is my grandson, Caleb Eglin. My name is Bob Morgan, and I'm so excited and proud of him that he's making, uh, placing his trust in Christ, and I'm looking forward to watching his growth with Jesus. Caleb, since you place your trust in Jesus Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My name's Tony, and this is my new, new brother in Christ that uh, suffered a lot of troubles in life and anxiety. has been a, a tool that Satan's tormenting, tormenting him with all his life. It took a lot of courage to step up and confess Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm proud of you and the decision you're making that today he's given you the power to be set free. Because you put your faith and trust in Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Sean, this is my new brother in Christ, Sean, as well, and, uh, and he's been a strong faithful man, he stands strong uh, early in his walk, and I've watched him uh, show great leadership skills, and uh, I'm excited to see what the Lord does with you. Because you put your faith and trust in Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is Jay Lynn. Jalen's been, a, Jaylen's been a, a light from the time we met him. He's been excited. He stands up every day. We're together and prays over people and, and just shares how much God's done in his life. Jalen, I'm, I'm proud of you, brother, because of your faith and trust in Christ. 
I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My dear friend Joe, uh, Joe, after sharing with me the, the abuse that you went through in your life, it wasn't just the average abuse. It blowed my mind. I'm so sorry that you had to go through that, that your father did not love you the way he's supposed to, and he did what he did to you. But today, you've got a new father. And he's going to love you like you're supposed to be loved. <laughs> he loves you. Because your faith and trust in Christ and your confession that he is your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Guys, my name is Chris Morgan. I serve with FCA at the University of Louisville. This is Jeff Novak. Jeff attended FCA in 2013 with his then-girlfriend, Kelsey. And God was doing something. Seeds were planted. And God was doing something only he could do. He was preparing Jeff's heart to receive and understand the gospel. And Jeff, I'm proud of you, man. And it's my challenge that you make this church, this big church, small. And that you get plugged in. in a couple's Bible study or a man challenge, man. And your wife, Kelsey, and your two kids, they see you as the most godly man they've ever met. Man, it's my privilege since you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's from Olive Branch, Mississippi, and his mom and dad made the trip this morning to see their son. Then you were blessed. You were blessed with a, a godly mom and dad that taught you the principles. You said you were always in church, but the church was never in you. And so today, today you've accepted Christ, your Lord and Savior, and you're making this decision on your own. So since you place your faith in Jesus Christ alone, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So one of the things we do every single week as a family is we take communion together. And so maybe where you are, uh, that means you'll do it afterwards, or maybe you can do that right now. That'd be great either way. Uh, but one of our favorite parts of communion is getting the body together and just being reminded of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And so, uh, you know, transparently, one of our favorite, this is one of our favorite weeks, as we've talked about the GMHC being in town and hosting that conference here. Uh, one of the best parts is we get a room full of people, a city full of people that are doing ministry all over the globe. And so... Uh, one of our favorite partners is a guy named Daniel. I can't tell you his last name. Is actually inside the room right now. But just for security reasons, we can't completely share online all that he's doing. But we just wanted to remind you right now and just get the picture of this as we take communion together. Just would you be reminded today that the gospel is just moving with power all over the globe. I know Daniel in northern Nigeria, they're watching uh, leaders of other religions come to faith left and right. And I'm telling you, it's hostile. It's dangerous. He has a bounty on his head. There are death threats against him. And a lot of our partners, that's their story. And yet in the middle of that, they are a part of the body of Christ. And they continue to watch God show up in impossible, extravagant ways. And so today, maybe as you set your heart and get ready for the message, Kyle's coming with a good one today, I'm telling you. Would you just prepare your heart? I just want you to be reminded as we take communion as a family, as we gather together as a family, that the gospel is still moving in power. And it's still the most explosive thing that you can attach your life to. So right now, just in the next worship set, would you maybe even just refocus your mind and your heart on the fact that we worship a great big old God and his kingdom is advancing and we have an opportunity to join. Let's continue to worship.
praise you in this place. We follow after you with all that we are, God. Not because it's easy, but because you are worthy, God. No matter the cost, our lives are yours, God. We worship you in this place. And we thank you for the cross that you bore for sinners, for broken people like us, God. We stand amazed by your grace and in awe of your mercy. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And Jesus said to another person, come follow me. And the man agreed, but he said, Lord, first, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Verse 61, and another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And we come to mantra number four, grip the plow. The Bible uses a lot of agricultural language and metaphors to help us understand our purpose in life and the mission that we've been called to. And there's a lot of discussion these days about how to discern what God's will is for your life. A lot of people searching for meaning and for purpose. What does God want me to do? And the Bible uses this agricultural imagery to help unlock some of that for us. And so if you study scriptural, scripture, you'll find that like geographical areas are often described as fields, and God is prayed to as the Lord of the harvest. And the gospel is the seed that gets planted and watered. And, and then we are the field workers. We are those that plow, that plant, and harvest. That's the imagery that's used. That's the picture that we have to help us understand our role and what God wants to do in this world. Now, we don't live in an agrarian society. And so this metaphor is easy to overlook. And we can't really switch it over to more of an industrial or, or business type culture. It doesn't... doesn't transition very good, right? Like there's a difference between working in a field and getting dirty and sweaty and sitting behind a desk and signing papers with well manicured hands. Like these are two different metaphorical images. And we are called to be field workers. I talk to our staff about this sometimes, that God has not called us to be business professionals that sit in an office all day. We are called to be field workers and that means we get dirty and sweaty working out in the fields. This is who we've been called to be. And so this grip the plow metaphor, this mantra, I'm not sure it's super enticing or appealing. Like maybe instead of grip the plow, if it was like grip the remote, that would, that would appeal to us a little bit more. But the call of grip the plow is a call to work. It's a call to personally engage. It's a call to every person who is a part of this church family to get involved to not sit on the sidelines, to not just show up and intend from time to time, but to say, I'm a part of that family and I'm gonna be on mission with what God has called us to do as a church in this community and around the world. And so I can't imagine what God would do in and through this church if every person who said, this church is my church, would grip the plow. Because it's, it's just easy to come and attend from time to time, but not really be committed I was at the airport last week and I ran into this uh, guy, uh, just struck up a conversation with him and he said he grew up in Louisville. I asked him what school he went to and then eventually I said, hey, do you, do you go to church anywhere? And he said, actually, I, I go to uh, Southeast Christian Church. And I'm like, <laughs> really? Really? And he had no idea who he was talking to and I'm like, uh, I, I hear they've got this uh, new preacher. What do, you, what do you think of him? And... Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't really. I was, uh, I was gracious, kind of let it go, but that's happened a few times to me over the years where people will say, well, I, I go to Southeast. I, I think what they mean by that is I went to Southeast. I, I think maybe when they were kids, they attended some at some point. I think maybe they've come to an event somewhere along the way where they pulled in the parking lot, and so now when someone says, what church do you go to, they just say, 
southeast. That way the person will kind of leave them alone. And, and it scares me somewhat because how many people are out there with, that would say, southeast is my church, but they are not on mission with what God is calling us to as a church. They don't necessarily represent what it means to follow Jesus to our community. And so what we wanna do as, as members of this church family is we want to be field workers. We want to be on mission together, accomplishing what God has called us to. And, and so this mantra comes from Luke 9, just to give you a little context. At this point, Jesus is still really popular in his ministry, and so you have these three prospective followers that want to follow Jesus, but listen, here's what they have in common. They wanna follow Jesus in such a way that it doesn't really require anything from them. They want a no-strings-attached relationship with Jesus. It's kind of what they're looking for. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get the benefits, but not so close that it requires anything from them. Right? They want to be close enough to be entertained by the miracles, I think, and maybe be inspired by his teaching, but, but not so close that they have to make a commitment. They want to attend, but they don't want to engage. They want to show up, but they don't want to step up. And so Jesus is gonna to speak to them about the fact that that's not the kind of relationship he's looking for. So I, I came across this passage in a way that personally convicted me. Um, some of you will remember, I think it was 2008 when I preached on an Easter weekend and I, I started my sermon in a bit of an unusual way, especially for Easter. I got up on that weekend and with... Uh, some tears in my eyes, I just repented to the church family about not having some of the right motives for ministry. God had convicted me of it on that Thursday before Easter weekend. I'd come into the sanctuary and I, I sat down to pray, asking God, what do you want me to say on Easter weekend? Because I was starting to feel some pressure I knew there would be a lot of people on Easter weekend, 30,000 people. There'd be a lot of creasters there, you know, the people who only come Christmas, Easter creasters. And I wanted to say something that the, the creasters would, would engage in. I wanted to be funny. I wanted to be creative. I wanted to be inspiring. I wanted to be entertaining. I wanted the crowd to like me. And, and so on that Thursday, I was praying and asking God, God, what do you want me to say? And the thought struck me, well, what did Jesus say whenever he had the big crowds? And I picked up a Bible out of the chair in front of me. I opened it up, and I started to read through the Gospels, looking at the Gospels through this lens. What did Jesus say at, the, at those moments? And what I discovered uh, just brought a lot of conviction in my life. I, I started looking at different passages, like John 6, there's this huge crowd. Jesus has fed all of them with the little boy's lunch. The next day, they don't go home. They wake up, and Jesus wakes up, and they want more free food. Like, where's the buffet? Where's the breakfast buffet, Jesus? And Jesus discerns that that's the only reason they're there. And so Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. In other words, he says to them, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you've been coming, but there comes a point where you need to decide, are you here to follow me, or are you here for the free bread? And at the end of that story, John chapter 6, verse 66 says that from this time on, many disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And what I was struck by is that Jesus seemed okay with that, like he didn't chase after them. He, he didn't get the disciples together and say, hey guys, we gotta, we gotta do something here. Let's have an ice cream social and we'll get some, somebody call, let's get some inflatables out here and we'll have door prizes for whoever brings the most friends. Like that wasn't the strategy. He seemed okay with the facts that some of the crowd went home and what he was left with were people who really wanted to follow. And as a church, we want, we want people to visit and come and we want this to be a safe place to ask questions and to discover. I want, I want you to feel not just welcome but wanted no matter where you're at on your spiritual journey. But we also want to, as a church, be intentional to say to people, there comes a time when you need to step over a line where you make a commitment, because ultimately what will define you and define your life are the commitments that you make. And, and so the most miserable people I know are the Christians who try to kind of have one foot on both sides of this line. 
And so I sat there in the sanctuary just kind of convicted about the fact that, that Jesus was okay with the crowds leaving. And I just sat here and I, I cried. I told God I was sorry. And God's like, well, I'm not the only person you need to apologize to. And I stood up in front of all of you on that Easter and I said I was sorry. And I made a promise to God and, and to all of you that as long as God in his grace would allow me to be a preacher and leader at this church, that I would, I would never do that. I would never water down the gospel in hopes that people will like me more. I would never change or soften what, script, what scripture teaches in hopes of a crowd coming back. And, and so as a church, we wanna be really clear with the call here, and the call is, is to grip the plow. That we wanna gauge success as a church, and not by how many people come and sit, by how, but by how many people are sent out how many people leave this place to be a light in the world and to live out the mission that God has called us to? We don't want to gauge success by how many people attend, but by how many people are engaged. And, and so in, in Luke chapter 9, we read this passage, and the heading in the NIV just says, the cost of following Jesus, and then we read about these three people, three prospective followers, they all want to follow Jesus. Um, the first person says, I will follow you to Jesus wherever you go. This is a good word here, wherever. That word means like no conditions. He's not negotiating with Jesus. He seems to understand lordship. I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus says to this man, uh, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Jesus says, uh, hey, I'm homeless, bro. You know that? Just want to make sure... A you're welcome, but like this is, this is where we're sleeping tonight. You in? And, and Jesus puts this man at a crossroads where he can go left and follow him, or he can go right and follow comfort, but you can't follow Jesus and follow comfort at the same time. And I, I think that for most of us, we'll reach a place like this in our lives where we'll have to choose between following Christ and following comfort, between what God's dream is for us and the American dream is for us that there'll be a time where God just says, yeah, you, you, you're gonna have to choose here. This is the same passage of scripture in Luke 9 where Jesus says, verse 23, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up a cross daily, and follow me. Taking up a cross is uncomfortable. Like That's the most unappealing image Jesus probably could have come up with to describe following him to that audience at that time. It's not comfortable. And so this man says, I'll follow you wherever. And Jesus says, what about over here where it's not, it's not comfortable? Because I think sometimes we mean what we say. Like we say to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. But really what we're saying is I'll follow you wherever you go as long as where you're going is where I was heading anyway. Right? It's kind of like if my wife and I go on a date and I, my wife says to me, hey, why don't you choose where we eat tonight? And I, I say to her, well, How's, how's Mexican? Does Mexican sound good? And she says, well, I had Mexican yesterday. <laughs> I'm like, okay, uh, how's, how's Italian? Italian sounds good. That's, that pasta just always makes, makes me feel a little bit tired. Uh, how, how about Thai? We haven't had Thai food for a little while. Thai's maybe just a little bit spicy for tonight. Okay, how about uh, sushi? Well, I mean, if that's where you want to eat, that's fine. I mean, if, I, if that's where you want to go, but... You know, you get to choose. Next time, I get to choose. But this time, it's your choice. And that, I think that's what we sometimes do with Jesus. We, we say, hey, I, I want to do whatever you want me to do as long as what you want me to do is what I really wanted to do all along. I, I want to date whoever you want me to date as long as who you want me to date is her. I, 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 I want to live wherever you want me to live as long as where you want me to live is where I want to live. And we say wherever, but that's not necessarily what we mean. And I, I think we can slip into this as a church. God, we want to do whatever you want us to do, as long as what you want us to do is comfortable, as long as I still get to have things my way, as long as my personal preferences are still being met. I, I, I want Holy Spirit 
to catch the wind. We want to raise the sails and catch the wind as long as the wind is going to blow us somewhere tropical, somewhere warm, where the waters are, are smooth and clear. Then yeah, absolutely, we're in for this adventure. And, and what you find here and what you find in other places is that following Jesus almost always means, well, let me put it this way, saying yes to Jesus almost always means saying no to me. It's not comfortable. I'm not saying it's not fulfilling. I'm not saying it isn't soul satisfying. I'm not saying there's no greater joy. But comfortable, if it's comfortable, you're, you're doing it wrong. I, uh, I asked some friends to finish this sentence. Saying yes to following Jesus meant saying no to, here's some of the responses I got. It meant saying no to my kids growing up in America, saying yes to Jesus meant saying no to continuing to live with my boyfriend, saying yes to following Jesus meant saying no to retiring and moving to the home I was having built in Florida. And just one after another, saying yes to Jesus meant saying no to comfort. So as a church, we want to grip the plow, we want to work the fields, and we want to do that in some fields that aren't necessarily easy. We believe that God is calling us to, to work in some fields that will be difficult. And so one of the things we're gonna continue to do as a church is to launch new campuses. We've seen this incredible uh, fruit from this. The E-Town e campus just celebrated its 250th baptism. Um, the Southwest campus is five years old. They just celebrated their 777th uh, baptism. Um, last weekend, the first couple from Chapel in the Woods was baptized uh, as a result of coming to, to the campus at Chapel in the Woods. And so we're, we're just seeing God move. We see the wind blowing. We're raising the sails. We want to continue to do that. We're excited about our Shelbyville campus and some other campuses uh, we're praying about. But, but I also hope that as a church that we're going to grip the plow and we're going to start some campuses that will be difficult, be out of our comfort zone a little. Like I will pray that we will start a Southeast Espanol campus. I don't know if you know this, but outside of the state of Florida, this area has the second highest amount of Cuban immigrants living, living here in our own backyard. And, and God's calling us as a church to work in those fields. I, I, I believe that God will call us to start a Southeast International campus because within 20 minutes of where I'm now preaching, there's three blocks where more than 100 languages are spoken. We need to... We need to do something there. I, I believe God will call us to start a, a Southeast University campus. We've got 20,000 students that come to the University of Louisville. I'm so thankful for FCA and works that we get to be a part of, but there's a lot of work left to do in that field. We get to grip the plow and, and get to it. I, I, I'm excited about the idea of God helping us launch some um, South, Southeast uh, halfway house campuses some behind bars campuses, because we want to worship with our brothers and sisters in, in places that, that we might think as difficult. But God's already at work, he's already moving, we get to join him in that. But listen, we need you. If, if you just come and attend and show up, that's great. We're glad you're here, but please don't call yourself a part of this church. I, I, not yet. I, mean, I hope you'll get to that point, but, but being a part of this church family means that you're in on this, that we're, we're on mission together, that we, we are here as followers of Jesus, not coming in thinking, well, what am I gonna get out of this? We're coming in saying to God, God, how can you use me? How can I be a part of advancing your kingdom and preparing this world for your return? So I gotta tell you a few other things that I, I just believe God's calling us to as a church. We, we are heavily involved in, in what we would talk about as community transformation. A lot, a lot going on in a lot of our communities where our campuses are located. I, I'll show you a slide quickly that just kind of breaks some of this down. Um, this category is meeting tangible community needs. So this is like crisis assistance and, and job training and, and legal assistance for people who need legal aid and medical clinics that we help start and such. Uh, recovery and restoration. Uh, these are residential programs, drug rehabilitation, prison transition, adult entertainment, outreach. Uh, preventative work with vulnerable populations and so uh, pregnancy resources and, and working with immigrants and refugees and, and with students. And so a, a lot is happening. What I want you to understand is, is that 
that this is something that you are a part of if you're a part of this church family, that these are fields where God is calling us to work, to grip the plow. And if you're a part of this church family, then these are the fields that we wanna work on together. Now, just by, by giving, just by being a part of this church, you're already having significant contribution. But, but we want you to, to grip the plow, to, to not just be like, oh, well, that's, that's nice. I'm, I'm glad I get to be a part of something like that. But that you would be praying and serving and giving and sacrificing so that we can continue to advance what God's already doing. There's so much more that we want to do. It's gonna mean making some shifts as a church. It means we're gonna shift some time and money resources away from some events and programs that might bring a lot of people to one of the campuses, and we want to shift that into the communities so that our campuses and the people who make up our church family can, can have more and more opportunities to reach out to the world around them with, with the love of Jesus. We, we want to, as a church, put the full force of the church behind reaching and loving one, one person at a time. We, we want to show the love of God in radical ways to one person at a time. That's how we wanna be known as a church. That's the big church that loves people in radical ways one at a time. That's what we long for. And we wanna be known as a church that cares for vulnerable children. I, I have studied quite a lot about how God is using this church in our communities. And one of the threads that seems very clear to me is that God is using this church in, in really significant ways to care for vulnerable children. And so we, we want to raise the sails, and, and we want to catch that wind. Well, my prayer is that within five years from now, that even if no one's, you know, even if someone hasn't walked in the doors of this church, that when they hear about Southeast, they will think, oh, that's the church that cares for vulnerable kids. And that means that we can't just pretend like the 24% of the children in our, in our community don't live below the poverty level. It means we need to do something. We need to do more. It, it, it means that we need to be more intentional to walk alongside struggling single moms. It, it means that we can't just look away from the thousand plus children who are in the foster care waiting to be adopted. It means that we, we're not gonna pretend like sex trafficking is just something that happens in other places, other cities. That's happening in our own communities. And God is calling us to step into those places with the gospel to rescue, to, to heal, to redeem. And so we want to grip the plow, and we want to, to work those fields, and, and we need each of you to say I'm in. I, I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I, would, I would rather have a 1,000 brothers and sisters gripping the plow and working the fields than 30,000 people who show up on a weekend to be entertained. I, I believe... I believe that when we all engage, that there's a supernatural power that's gonna come upon this church and God's gonna use this church in ways that we can't even imagine. I, I say that with clear gratitude for the way God is already at work. I mean, let me, let me talk to you just a bit about um, uh, global evangelism. All right, here's a, a map of the, the world. And on this map you have... Um, you have two colors. I've struggled all weekend identifying whatever this color is. I want to say blue, but I know that's not. Like, so I've, I've gone with teal. Teal? So this is teal. And then there's some countries that are, are shaded black. What I want you to understand is that the, the countries that are shaded black are the countries where we are not. Where we are not. That every other country that is shaded teal that we are, as a church, we as a church have a presence there, a gospel presence in every one of those countries. Now my, when I see that, I, I celebrate it, but my mind also goes to the Great Commission where Jesus says, go into all the world, all the world. And I look at this and I'm like, we could do that. Like we could, as a church from Kentucky and Indiana, literally go into all the world. Now, I, I'll be honest with you. Some of these countries that are shaded black are shaded black for a reason. It's, they're some of the most difficult places to get to. But I believe God is gonna use us as a church 
so that every, every country in this world is, is teal. In fact, last uh, hour, I was talking to a couple of guys uh, after the service, and they said, hey, um, we are from uh, Madagascar. I'm like, really? That's awesome. He's like, no, no, we're from Madagascar. It's black on your map. You, you don't think you're there, but you're there. You're in, you're in Madagascar. And they were here for the Global Missions Health Conference, and just being able to see um, how God is at work. It, it, look, I know we have a lot of, uh, you know, pessimism sometimes about uh, how difficult things are in the world, and there's just, but there's never been a more exciting time to be alive, y'all. Th- that we get to be a part of a church from, from Kentucky and Indiana that has an opportunity to reach the entire globe, be a part of reaching the entire globe with the gospel, and that we have an opportunity in our lifetime to see the great commission fulfilled, that we, that we have an opportunity to usher in the second coming of Jesus, it, it's, it is an incredible time to be a part of this church, and to live in this world, to grip the plow and work in these fields. And, and so Jesus challenges, um, challenges this man by pointing him out of our comfort zone, point, point, pointing him out of his comfort zone. And I, I know that he's doing that for many people in our church. Um, I need to move quickly. We have so many baptisms. I've got to cut my sermon short all the time. <laughs> The, uh, uh, that's good, that's good. I try not, I try not to be bitter about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm just playing. So, I love it. Uh, leave me five minutes, uh, that's good. I don't, uh, some of you are like, yeah, that does sound about right. Uh, Luke, <laughs> Luke 9, the second person, verse 59, he said to another man, follow me, but the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go proclaim the kingdom of God. And that doesn't seem very uh, pastoral of Jesus, right? Like, let the dead bury their own dead. What's well, his dad? Most commentators would agree that what the man is really saying is when my dad dies, I'd like to follow you, but not right now. That his dad had not died was probably in good health, right? Maybe a head cold and a bum knee from football, but he's good, he's, he's fine. And the guy's really saying, hey, when my dad dies and I get the inheritance and I can be financially secure, then it'll be a good time for me to follow you because I can have financial security and I can follow you. And, and once again, there's a crossroads. It's not how it works. The guy says to Jesus, first let me. Anytime Jesus calls you to something and the first word out of your mouth is the word first, that's a problem because you're putting off something God wants you to do now by telling him later. Tomorrow is not a word that the Bible knows when it comes to obedience. I I have a friend named um, Scott. He's about 10 years older than me. Um, Told me I could share this with you. When he was in high school, he felt Jesus calling him to a deeper relationship. And he told God, hey, I'm in, just not right now. When I get to college, I'll get serious about my faith. He gets to college, again he has some moments where he senses God is is pursuing him, and again he says to God, well, look, yes, my answer's yes, but first let me graduate from college, and they got a diploma, and God says, well, what about now? And and Scott said, well, now's not a great time because I just got this job, and I need to kind of establish myself financially, and when I get married and have kids, and he got married and he had kids, and God said, well, what about now? Well, it's just so busy right now. So first, first let things settle down a little bit and then we're gonna get in church, then we're gonna get serious about following you. And the good news for Scott is eventually he responded, he said yes to following Jesus, but he lost a lot in the middle. He, he, his wife left him, took the kids. He gets to see him every other weekend, so he has plenty of time to go to his AA meetings. And so in the land of tomorrow, is where you find this, and the land of tomorrow is where you find addiction and divorce and unfaithful spouses and prodigal children, and it's just constantly saying, okay, I hear you, Jesus, but not right now, and and today is the day. Now is the time. And lastly, it ends with another person saying, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family, and Jesus says, 
No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. He says that because he loves you. In, in, in the same way that when a husband and, and wife stand up on their wedding day and exchange vows and express commitment, forsaking all others, it's not a, it's an expression of love. I want your whole heart. I want all of you. I, I, I've talked to this church before about the fact that one of my concerns is what um, psychologists call a bystander effect. It's where people see a need, but there's, also, there's so many other people, they just think, well, somebody else will do something. And it's becoming more common in our culture because, um, well, an example is in Kansas City, a woman was ass assaulted in the middle of the day in a parking lot. Ten people witnessed it. Two people recorded it on their phones, but, but no one intervened, and no one called the police. The reason wasn't because all those people were bad and evil. It's just that they saw how many people were seeing it. And if there's this many people seeing it, then somebody will do something. Somebody else will give. Somebody else will preach. Somebody else will volunteer. Somebody else will sing. Someone else will serve. Someone else will do something. And, and my concern for us as a church is that that bystander effect sometimes is all too real. And so my... My invitation to you is if you consider this to be part of your church family, make a commitment to it, to grip the plow. Uh, ultimately, your life is determined by what you say yes to and what you say no to. It's really that simple. Your whole life is determined by what you will say yes to. And I know it's easy to try to ride the middle of that, not make any kind of commitment, but that's not what you want your life to be determined by, it's not, it's not what you want to define your existence. So here's how we're gonna end is um, I, I have uh, some tables set up here in the front, some tables set up in the middle and, and out in the hallways. And I, I know we're running a little bit late. And, but I, I just wanna ask you if you're a part of this church family to take this time and on these tables are cards where we just asked you to finish a sentence that says, I commit to. And we've had some responses over the course of the last few services. Um, here's some examples. You can steal one of these if you want. I commit to praying for one different coworker every week. I commit to ending hunger for one person on the planet. I commit to increasing my giving by a certain percentage. I commit to meeting every single one of my neighbors by the end of the year. I commit to getting baptized by the end of the year. I commit to serving somewhere in the church to impact the next generation. I commit to reading God's word daily starting today. I commit to selling $2,000 worth of my stuff and giving the money to missions. I commit to praying daily for God to interrupt my schedule and to love people one at a time. I commit to taking the next step to foster a local child. I commit to fasting every Monday until dinner, asking God to move in our church. I commit to supporting a missionary full time or raising this needed support so he or she can focus on working in the fields where they are. I commit to asking my parents to spend, a child wrote, to spend my Christmas present money on a family that needs help this year. I commit to inviting at least one neighbor into my house once a month. I commit to selling an extra car and using the money to help a family that lacks basic con transportation. I, I commit to ask four coworkers how I can pray for them this week. I commit to being one of the 1,000 people that will be sent out from this church, and the list goes on. And so I'd love to challenge you to be specific and to be bold, to write that down. We don't wanna be people of tomorrow. We don't want to be a church of tomorrow. We want to say to God, today I let go of comfort. Today I choose a path of commitment. Today I will join you and I will join your church family and I will grip the plow and I will work the fields. Let's pray. God, you are so gracious to us that you would give us the privilege to be a part of what you do. And God, anyone who has chosen following you over comfort, they don't want sympathy. There's no greater joy than living out the adventure that you have for us. The people I know that are most miserable are the people who live for themselves trying to get as much pleasure and comfort that they can in this life, it, it doesn't work. God, I believe that you're doing an incredible work through this church and you've been doing it a long time and that we are privileged to find ourselves with an opportunity to be a part of a movement like this. 
I, I pray, God, it's just the beginning that you would allow every single person here who would identify Southeast as part of their church family to make a commitment to engage, to sacrifice, to serve, to be a part of the mission that you want to accomplish in this world. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for redeeming us. And thank you for using us. It's in your name we pray, amen. So as we sing, um, I would love to invite you just to take a few minutes, stop by one of these tables and write down your commitment. There's no, no hurry. A little secret for y'all. The easiest way to get out of here is to wait, okay? So take your time and enjoy uh, listening to what God has to say. Raise the sails, catch the wind. And, and let's make some commitments as a church to grip the plow. Let's stand and worship. Well, we're gonna sing together. We do just wanna open up the room for you to move about, to come forward and respond. But we're also invite you to worship with us now. Let's sing.
Wow. Church family, this is a call to action. Jesus established the church for a purpose. And as Kyle pointed out, our purpose is not entertainment. Our purpose is not to be a, a feel-good motivational force. Our purpose is not to be an educational institution. The church has been given a mission to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. And to do that, we are going to grip the plow. We're going to be intent on doing the hard work in the fields. Now here at our physical locations, we have cards for people to fill out to make a commitment to action. And I want to invite you to do that digitally. So make your commitment right there in the chat feed on social media or on our Southeast website. And if you'd rather keep it confidential, you can just email that into Southeast online at sccc.org. But in any event, do it because making that commitment, typing that out, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause you to feel like, man, I just made a commitment and we want you to follow through on those things. Uh, speaking of responses, if you're ready to make a decision to give your life to Christ, to join our church, or if you're looking for a church to attend in your area, we'd love to come alongside you and help you in those things. And also, if you need prayer, and don't we all, we would love to pray with you. So just email us, southeastonline at sccc.org, or text the keyword online to 733-733. Uh, before we say goodbye, don't forget about the watch party in Mount Washington next Sunday at Pleasant Grove Elementary School. Doors are going to open at 1030, and if you live in the area, we would love to see you there. All right, online family, thanks for being with us today, and we look forward to seeing you back next week right here at Southeast Online.